All right, so this popped up in my news feed, and I'm going to be talking about something very limited controversy, which is gun rights and gun regulation. It was a news article by, well, it's a Twitter post, I guess, by Gavin Newsom. There's some suggestions on there, so let's get to it. All right, so this is the post. So I started to hear at this actual news item from Western Journal. It popped into my news feed. I started to read this because the headline was really kind, you know, kind of grabby. Governor Gavin Newsom officially calls for convention to change U.S. Constitution. The main bulk of this is going to come from this Twitter X post thing. Um, but just really quickly, this article goes over this idea that um, a constitutional convention, which hasn't been done since like 1789, is being called for to sort of talk about uh, safety. And the way in which this is being sort of proposed is this right to safety amendment. And that would help to limit uh, or regulate uh, gun ownership. This article goes on to talk more about uh, how this works. So the new amendment would coexist with the Second Amendment. So it's not getting rid of the Second Amendment. This is unlikely to move forward. One of the biggest obstacles in the way is that three fourths of the states would need to vote it in, right? So that's not likely. Quite frankly, even on things in which we have close to three fourths popularity in, we probably couldn't pass in through three fourths of the states. And part of that reason is that distribution model. So, for instance, like abortion, I think the last pro-choice uh, with regards to abortion, I think the last kind of survey or popularity kind of check I, I read was like 70 plus percent of U.S. citizens are pro-choice. The, the legal ramifications of that are not seen. There's not a direct connection. And part of that is because you will have uh, hotspots of citizens who are more liberally minded, um, in various high population states, uh, such as like California and various other locations. And it's very difficult to then get, you know, that the, the number of states that are more, uh, conservative, uh, even if they've got a percentage of the people inside of those states who would be pro-choice, uh, to actually a get out and vote B, um, do the necessary political action uh, in order to prevent these things, which shouldn't have to happen. Um, but, you know, demonstrations or walks or protests or anything like that. And then also to have them be able to have enough of voice to be able to elect officials who can, you know, just write it in or, or propose the, the, the bill onto the state, right? So there's a lot of that kind of distribution model issue uh, that occurs that would make this very difficult. Um, so why I found this kind of fascinating was here, you know, you have Gavin Newsom's, uh, article that proposes these things, right? Time to enshrine four widely supported gun safety freedoms, raising the minimum age to purchase a gun to 21, universal background checks, a reasonable waiting period for gun purchases and banning civilian purchases of assault rifles. No more waiting around for Congress. It's time to act. And there's an article here. But what really caught my eye was there, there's a lot of the, what I might call the typical responses to these things, calling out a single individual instance where a gun was a positive in the scenario, right? Which I don't actually think is like a, a diehard Second Amendment uh, rights uh, person's best argument. Um, these kind of situations that are, you know, great. I'm glad this person was able to defend themselves. Um, but typically speaking, if you, you know, look at the large massive data, uh, that are, that is out there. Now, a lot of times women with guns are much more likely to be victims of gun violence than they would be if they didn't have a gun. Uh, and there's some statistics out there from the FBI. I won't be going into those cause they're not about this particular post that I thought was rather interesting. So this post from Fan of Objective Truth, right on the nose, right for the, the name, maybe, who knows. Um, I thought it was worded uh, well, but not 
good, right? There's clearly a bias by this person. They're not really necessarily open to objective truth. Um, they might be in a personal way and they just kind of worded it in the sort of a salesy or, or kind of marketing sort of way. Um, but so did, you know, Gavin Newsom. So to that effect, the questions that are asked, I think are fair ones in order to answer. Like, can we find research that supports these things? Okay. I think some of the follow-up questions are uh, positioned so that research can't be found. Um, and just as an overview, really quickly, for those who didn't know, you know, for like decades, um, well, maybe a decade, at the very least for a long time, uh, the CDC was banned from doing gun violence by fire, you know, gun violence um, research by the Congress. Uh, you, you, they just couldn't do it. It wasn't allowed. So they couldn't see the effects or ramifications. So we're just, again, getting into a period of time in which I believe that's now possible. Uh, but there's still a lot of influence that was built up during that time that, of course, prevents it from being long-term or, or good studies. And there's lots of threats or pressures that make it so that you might not want to do it. And then there's just a culture of not having done it for such a long time. It's really hard to get kind of the interest and research to do so because of the political will against uh, anything that might regulate the Second Amendment. Before getting going, the question you might ask yourself is, where are my okays for regulation versus not okays? Now, if you're a diehard Second Amendment uh, 2 a -er, uh, right, you might say there's no regulation, nothing can infringe upon it. Okay, so the question you'd want to ask yourself is, if a person was just released from prison, and they were a mass murderer, and they're now out for whatever reason, should they be allowed to buy a gun? That's a question. If you're saying yes, okay, you're still on board with your no infringement. If you're saying no, then you're infringing, uh, you know, that's, that's a form of regulation, which you're saying is infringement. Uh, or any uh, criminal, for that matter, any felony, uh, a rapist, um, a murderer, a, you know, um, child molester, whatever, are they allowed in your mind to go and buy a gun? Uh, if you're going to put any limits on particular criminals, that is a regulation. That is technically in your mind from your first presentation, an infringement on your rights, uh, infringements on rights to own weapons. Okay. Second thing is what kind of weapons? So should they be able to get rockets? I know it seems ridiculous. Right? Bombs. What about um, fighter jets, tanks, um, nuclear weapons, right? Where is your, it, do you have a limit? Because uh, we, you are proposing, right, that you're taking uh, old language that just says, you know, bear arms, and you are specifically targeting uh, firearms with that as well. You're saying it's okay. What about a 50 caliber sniper rifle? Should you allow, be allowed to go buy that in a Walmart? Should you have to sign up for that? Should you have to put any kind of licensing or registration down for that? Should you have to be tracked in any way, shape, or form when you make those kinds of purchases? So those are the kinds of questions you have to ask yourself. If you're saying in any way, shape, or form that those things are limited you ought not have those things, right? You're okay with some form of regulation. Whether that's where you stop, you're like, okay, if it explodes, no, right? Grenades, no, go, right? Whatever the case may be, you know, you may have a limit, you may have a line, you can't say zero limitations or regulations uh, are allowed and any of those are infringements. Okay, so to this post, to this specific post, what is the 21 year age limit based upon? Is there a disproportionately high percentage of people under 21 committing crimes with their own legally purchased firearms? I think this question would be actually better if they just stopped with what is the 21 year age limit based upon? Where is that coming from? The second part puts in their own bias or nuance um, and setting a, a sort of standard for a kind of answer that is very difficult to research. 
is there a disproportionately higher percentage of people under 21 committing crimes with their own legally purchased firearms? First of all, um, it's difficult to track a legal purchase to a child, right? Someone under the age of 18. And any kind of crime for someone under the age of 18 is oftentimes protected, right? So what kind of crimes count? And are those crimes going to be protected? And can we actually uh, track that information? Can we even track the purchase? Their money may not be their own or coming specifically from them. It may come through a parent rental figure, even though it's them, right? So legally purchased, but th they're allowed to purchase certain things. Um, so we, we want to kind of clarify this a little bit more. What is... What I'm going to be researching is what is the 21 year age limit based upon? And then if there's information out there, um, the disproportionately higher percentage of people under 21 committing crimes might be worthwhile to investigate because there is a proposal to move it from 18 up to 21. So that's a, it's a fair question. Like where, why are we choosing 21 versus some other age? Okay. Exactly what criteria from a background check would disqualify someone from making a purchase? All these exactlys could have been got rid of, and I would say that would make this post more reasonable, um, coming from a more of a standpoint of, I want to actually find objective truth instead of trying to kind of influence that, like exactly what, because that's going to be um, setting it up for a technicality or a semantics argument that could then be used to counter and say, well, you didn't prove it 100%. Well, nothing's provable 100%, right? What's the likely answer? So just asking these questions would be better. So what criteria from the background check would disqualify someone from making a purchase? There's already some answers out there. We already have background checks, uh, right? So we know some of that information, but we can maybe research like what um, foreign countries do, other countries do, and our help with this, or just what the federal background check does um, versus per perhaps, you know, like in those proposals versus say state background checks. So we can do a little bit of research there. I don't know if I can say what Gavin Newsom specifically is calling for. Right? Exactly what would be the reasonable waiting period? Okay, reasonable is in quotation marks. Uh, that's fine because that's being called out as the actual word in the actual, you know, suggestion. What would be the reasonable waiting period? What are the statistics on crimes of passion committed with firearms purchased immediately before the action. So we can see, do waiting periods have an effect? Um, we can we can track that. I'm, I'm Hopefully, <laughs> we can find some information on that. And then exactly what are the criteria used to define a particular firearm as an assault weapon? This one I see a lot. Um, there's this argument that says, and, and this happens a lot in these kinds of debates, right? Where certain words are used from an outside perspective, where we you know, the general populace will look at um, weapons and say, saw weapons are generally like larger rifles um, or smaller rifles, even just that have either like a semi-automatic or a really easy fire rate um, adjustment to, you know, where like you don't need to shoot 15 bullets into a deer uh, to hunt. Uh, but you could use the, uh, like a rapid firing weapon that shoots 15 bullets very quickly um, into a crowd of people. And you don't have to be especially trained with a lot of these weapons, right? Like there, someone might argue, well, bolt action rifle can shoot very quickly if you're well trained it. Yeah, of course it could. Um, but you can't really, you can't really supply that person or allow that person to buy a weapon that they're not going to be great with because they're super fantastic at it, right? But for the general population, can I go to a store, pick up a weapon that I can then you know, mass murder people with very easily. Um, that's kind of what the image of cultural assault weapon is. But in firearms, I've heard this a lot from, you know, kind of fire nerds, geeks, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they will come back and say, well, there's no assault weapon classification in firearms. It, it, doesn't exist, right? Um, so what are you actually talking about? Yeah, a lot of times people will do this to me and there's certain laws out there. That I, I remember watching a video where a guy would walk around parks with um, a gun and it looked particularly menacing. But I, I forget, it either had a stock or it didn't have a stock. One of the two, 
And that's what classified it different from a rifle versus handgun. And the law technically prohibited one of those two, the opposite of what he had done. And they did it specifically to get police to come out and confront them and film it, right? To uh, pretend to showcase police officers as not doing their job and protecting this guy. And they should have just ignored him because he, well, ignoring people who just have a gun walking through a family park seems by most people's standards that I've ever met, um, strange, uh, especially in a day and age where those kinds of people might cause harm. So they are disturbing the peace, even though it's like a protected form of disturbing the peace, right? You can still call the cops every single time when that is happening. Uh, but especially like a family park, right? And you're not going to wander up to the person and be like, Hey, are you planning on shooting all of us today? Right? You want to be on the side of safety. And that makes sense. Especially if you've got your kids there or whatnot. Um, and cautiously from somebody like that. Cause you don't know if they're crazy. You don't know if they're purposefully doing this and they're crazy. You know, lots of questions and the harm of not asking those questions could literally mean death. Even if that's a low probability, uh, it has high impact, right? So low frequency, high severity, um, those sort of situations you are going, Hey, um, police officer, I would like to know. Whereas in a stand your ground sort of state, right? If a person like that was wandering through that park and you happen to have a gun on you, um, you could just shoot them. Even though they were doing their legal right of carrying a weapon, you felt, uh, threatened, right? So if you were to shoot and kill that person, would he, you know, and say he lived, would he still be going like, well, good job. You know, you were following your second amendment rights to carry a weapon. You were following your state law in order to stay in your ground. Probably not. Right. He would probably be like, why were you shooting me? I was just carrying a gun. Okay. Well, that, that's not how those laws work. Um, anyways, I'm thinking these questions are great questions to ask in terms of, can we actually find information on this? What, what information does this have? Um, with those caveats that there's not going to be a lot of studies potentially that are new, um, or the studies are going to be so new and from such third parties that they're trying to build funding. So I anticipate a lot of this stuff is going to be data that isn't very compelling, even if it might be compelling to start so that we can see its, its effect, right? Um, and I don't necessarily agree with all these. I don't know exactly where we're getting all of them from. Um, but yeah, uh, one thing I will say is uh, that if we continue with Second Amendment rights where people should be able to own uh, weapons and we do create uh, additional background checks, right, to disqualify someone from a purchase unless they go through, now, wherever those background checks or licensing fees cost money, that should be taken on as a social burden, right? Which a socializing gun background checks and licensing, um, because that would remove an undue burden on poor individuals from being able to actually participate in the rights that are protected comparatively to a wealthy person who can afford all those licensing things, which I think is actually consistent with the same argument of we don't want to require um, voter IDs. Um, because that actually puts an undue cost burden on poorer individuals. Uh, because you know you might think 110 to 600 dollars sometimes to resolve an ID issue is a small cost, right? To a poor person, that that's the that could be an an un, unattainable uh, amount of money in order to get an ID. So they wouldn't be able to exercise their right of voting. Or even if you did. Uh, even if they could put aside that money over a long period of time, it might mean the differences between eating and not eating in some instances, right? Um, there are situations like that where what we consider a small burden to some people is actually a rather large burden in order to exercise their rights. And so I think that that um, should play out in any requirement or mandated uh, background checks as well, just to be consistent. Anyways, um, I don't own a gun. I'm not a pro gun person. Um, we'll see whether or not I'm on the side of the fan of objective truth or more on Gavin Newsom's side at the end. Um, 
I hope I'm more on the Aete gun side. But, you know, who knows? We'll see what the research says. Okay. So, first thing I want to do is just kind of ask this question. Where, you know, does a 21-year age limit actually matter? There, There's some research rain.org i do kind of want to know what age a person can buy a gun in america across the board i'm pretty sure there's not restrictions on rifles but restrictions on handguns the effects of minimum age requirements let's see about that bearing arms i'm going to read that one too all right so the bear the right to bear arms is protected in american law by the second amendment cool it's a, that's already controversial right because i mean that's kind of where we cited um with the supreme court and whatnot but it's not necessarily, we don't know what bare arms actually means, right? Uh, it's a controversial topic. Yeah, we agree. It says federal law prohibits the possession of a handgun or handgun ammunition by a person under the age of 18. So handguns are more limited. Federal law prohibits no minimum age for the possession of long guns or long gun ammunition. So we already have a federal law that is restricting or infringing the rights of a person to bear arms. We could probably argue that below age of 18 they don't really have rights i mean no co the constitution doesn't protect them um that could be an argument so there's no federal law no minimum age by federal law for possession of long guns or long gun ammunition so long guns or rifles and shotguns uh licensed gun dealers aren't allowed to sell handguns to anyone under the age of 21 this is actually tricky licensed gun dealers one of the things i ran into is what makes a licensed gun dealer and in short, in most places, it is a person, you know, a, a person or, or business that is in the primary business of selling guns, which means if they are not in the primary business of selling guns, they're an unlicensed gun dealer. What's strange is in many, 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 many states, and I couldn't find a state where this wasn't true, but I'm sure there is, and I'm not a gun law expert, but it was startling to me that unlicensed gun dealers I would intuitively think a person's unlicensed to sell guns. They can't sell guns. It's not true. Unlicensed gun dealers are allowed to sell guns. Which makes it weird to me because they actually have sometimes fewer restrictions uh, than a licensed gun dealer would. Um, so just as some examples, for example, in Vermont, it's legal to sell a handgun or rifle to someone over 16 um, in Maine, Minnesota, or New York, you can sell a rifle to someone over, eight, uh, over 16. In Minnesota, as long as it's not in the city, you can sell a rifle to a 14-year-old without parental consent. And they put in here for context the legal drinking age in the U.S. is 21 because this is a place in the U.K. So they have to do both of those things where it's maybe a little bizarre to them. Because um, you're not really, without special exemption, you're not allowed to have a gun. In most places in the UK, if not all places, carrying a gun, some college campuses, right? There may be a no gun place unless you have a permit. In Michigan, you're now allowed to carry a weapon in previous gun free zones, such as schools, daycare centers, bars, churches, hospitals, and stadiums, um, as long as you complete an eight hour training course. Uh, they're extremely strange laws to many of us here in the UK, particularly as our gun laws got dramatically stricter at the Dumbling High School shooting there. All right. So that's just a breakdown from an outside perspective, doing research and normally have any incentive to kind of change those things. And generally, that's what I've seen. Let's go to here. The effects of minimum age requirements. So this was updated January 10th, 2023. So relatively new. Um, and specifically talking about minimum age requirements. So under federal law, licensed dealers cannot sell or deliver handguns to individuals under the age of 21 or long guns to those under age 18. Unlicensed individuals cannot sell, transfer, or deliver handguns to individuals under the age of 18. With some exceptions, federal law prohibits individuals under age 18 from possessing handguns, but it does not place age restrictions on the possession of long guns. So all that's to say is like you can't necessarily sell it um, or deliver it to a person under the uh, you know under these age restrictions, but um, at least with long guns for federal law, um, you can give them a long gun to shoot like if you're going out hunting or whatnot they can do so as well they just can't purchase it so let's talk about this so laws requiring a minimum age for purchase aim to make it more difficult for underage individuals to acquire firearms through formal channels because background checks do not access juvenile records those aged 18 with established histories of presenting a risk of harm to themselves or others may nevertheless pass 
background checks. Minimum age purchase uh, laws that set higher age thresholds allow more time for patterns of adult criminal behavior to be observed and recorded in the background check system. Laws requiring a minimum age of possession are instead intended to make it more difficult or risky for underage individuals to carry firearms. Okay, so with an age of 21, it means you've got basically three years of activity for the background check to pull on. But age 18, you have zero years in many instances. So if you're an exceptionally violent 17-year-old, but it doesn't, it stays in your juvenile record, then you could turn 18 and go and buy a gun without really any restriction. Um, and so that's why, you know, that may be a reason. So it sounds, at least from the first paragraph, pro the possibility. So firearm homicides and violent crimes disproportionately involve individuals under age 21, both as perpetrators and as victims. That seems still pro. Indeed, in 2020, arrest rates for violent crimes peaked between ages 18 and 20. That's the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. So that's just saying arrest rates for violent crimes in general peak at 18 to 20. So, um, you know, that's... If we keep that age restriction, then most people will have, you know, it will be on the way down. That will avoid the highest point of violent criminals or violent crimes being committed in that person's life. So although they may have used a knife in particular examples, if they could afford a gun, you know, what, what would have happened then? So of the 12,319 firearm homicides committed in 2020, for which the age of the offender was known, 44% were perpetuated, uh, perpetrated, sorry, uh, by individuals aged 12 through 24. Um, which is only 17% of the general U.S. population, so it's a disproportionate uh, ranking. We know that the peak is 20, so 12 to 24. I'm wondering why that entire range is done. Maybe we can find more on this. This one's talking about the United States being one of the few countries worldwide where the rates of both firearm homicide and firearm suicide are higher than the global medians. Wow. An assessment of the global burden of firearm mortality found that the United States can for more than 90% of all children and youth killed by a firearm across 23 high income countries with pediatric firearm mortality rates that were as many as 49 times as high as though in, in other countries. I guess they're including suicide rates here, but still, that's, that is really high. Um, it's really telling. I'm, so this is just saying that the United States holds a per capita rate of firearms much higher than other places. Uh, the second highest country's rate is less than half as high, and Canada's rate is only a third of the U.S. is still ranked in the top 25. Numerous international and U.S. studies, meta-analysis, and systematic and scoping have found that higher rates of firearm ownership and access are linked to higher firearm violence. We'll check these meta-analyses. Try and get the latest one there. Okay, kind of back on track. Let's go back. Okay, um, of all 2020 deaths among those aged 16 to 21, 25.2% were homicides, 93.5% of which were firearm homicides. Now, that isn't to say that 93.5% of these 2020 deaths, right? Like the quarter of these, so 95% of that, still almost 100% of these, this quarter of homicides. Um, it's not to say that if we eliminate guns, we'll only have 6.5% of these homicides left, but it is to say that that is the current standing, right? And so they're not going to be 100% replaced by like knife homicides. It's just much harder to do, you know, lot, lots more risk for the person who's, you know, actually committing that crime. Anyways, um, but it is to say, it is fair to say that these, you know, this percent of those homicides is not just going to vanish because guns are gone. So I just want to be fair. Um,
Okay, so conceptually, by restricting youth access, minimum age restrictions can also reduce rates of firearm suicide or unintentional shootings by the affected age group. Research suggests a strong association between firearm availability and suicide among adolescents and young adults. In 2020, there were 3,305 suicide deaths amongst individuals, which involved a firearm. Between 50% and 60% of all firearm suicides by youth under the age of 21 involve a handgun, suggesting that minimum age laws that cover all firearms, i.e. long guns and handguns, may have a larger effect on suicide rates compared to laws focused on handguns alone. So one of the things to keep in mind, too, is like, there's a kind of, a, the, just like with the reduction in the homicides, yes, a certain percentage of these folks will just seek other methods of completing suicide. However, it's also important to note that things like overdosing, even if someone does overdose, uh, it's much more likely that uh, that person can be saved once they're found than from a firearm injury. And so that, you know, could be a plus because we could save people's lives. So it does say here, much of the existing evidence on sources of guns to youth comes from surveys of juvenile offenders or high-risk adolescents. So it's a survey, but suggests that purchases from retailers are relatively rare among adolescents involved with criminal activity. Surveys have found that among juveniles who have been incarcerated or arrested, youth offenders acquire their firearms through similar sources of adult offenders. More than 80% cited a friend, a family member, or the black market as the means by which they acquired their weapon. Furthermore, youth intend to use firearms for self-harm. Males have easy access to sources other than retailers. An early study of firearms used by students in school associated firearm deaths between 1992 and 1999 found that only 9.6% of the firearms used in homicide events and none of the firearms used in suicide events were purchased legally, which doesn't necessarily mean they were purchased illegally, um, but just like up above, they could have been given by a friend, a family member, or the black market. Uh, these findings indicate that minimum age laws may be effective at limiting youth access to firearms through legitimate retail sources. The groups, you know, the smaller percentages that were from retail sources, it could be effective in them. This sounds like a law preventing access or limiting access might not do much or won't do enough. Um, the overall limitation of access does have uh, compelling effects on the access and availability and cost in the black market. So it may not affect friends or families handing over a weapon, but even illegal access to weapons does seem to get harder from a local source uh, than uh, just by having regulations in those areas. Um, again, it doesn't eliminate it, um, but it just makes it harder to hold those, make them accessible. And then, you know, it does make it so that price goes up, which lowers the ability of supply, right? So there are some effects. Uh, I can't imagine that those are well studied other than through large analyses across countries where their only access to guns might be through illegal trade um, and how limited uh, that is. But nonetheless, um, some of those things have shown up in the past as well. Um, outside of just, does the law stop this particular person from getting it? Yes or no. This is saying in some effect, you know, even some additional effect psychologically about the risk getting the weapon, carrying it around. 6.8% of high school males and 1.9% of high school females reported carrying a gun on at least one day in the past year for purposes other than hunting or recreation. So interesting. Like in a terrible way, right? That someone would even feel like they needed to carry a gun for like protection or whatnot. And I know clearly it happens, but that's also like a secondary problem that impacts all of this. Oh, here you go. So much of the conversation about minimum major restrictions revolves around handguns rather than long guns. This is because handguns are more frequently used than long guns in firearm suicides and violent crime. So in theory, raising the minimum age for such weapons could decrease violence without impacting lawful activities such as hunting. More restrictive minimum age laws could plausibly impact the gun industry by reducing the size of the consumer population and decreasing the ownership and use of guns by youth for hunting or recreational purposes. Overall, hunting participation in the United States has declined dramatically over the past decades, and although data on youth recreational firearm use are limited, 
Estimates from 2015 suggest that 1.8 million youth aged 6 to 15 engaged in hunting. Furthermore, a large majority of adult hunters initiate hunting activities before age 20, and those who have not learned to hunt by age 20 have a low likelihood of participating in hunting activities as an adult. Should minimum age laws reduce initiation of firearm use for hunting or recreational purposes, there could be longer-term effects on these outcomes. And it's just saying that there is an effect um, by reducing the overall population of guns in the society. So that's that's interesting. Um, we are just talking about that. And there's a bunch of resources in this article. So this is, or in this study results. This is definitely something to sort of dig in deep on. But we're getting some important information that may apply to some of the other things. Uh, so they do talk about a limitation on the data. So data, data on suicides and self-inflicted non-fatal injuries stratified by age are readily available. Thus, analyses can directly test whether effects of minimum age laws on these outcomes are driven by the relevant age group affected by the policy. For outcomes of violent crimes and non-self-inflicted injury, causal analyses could be improved with data that reported the age of the shooter. However, because most data sources report only the age of the victim, only two studies we identified met our inclusion criteria for this policy used data on the shooter's age. So one in 2001 and one in 2020. You can see there's a huge gap in between there and that's not because of lack of interest. Clearly, you've, if you've been alive during that time, you've seen all the media. Um, that's because of the, the prevention and dangers of even bringing this up you know, politically. Like if you're a Congress member and you bring up gun rights, you're probably going to see huge public movement uh, against you from certain groups and not that much of a push from the people who are on your side even because they just, you know, that's like preaching to the choir. Everyone's like, yeah, we've heard this a million times. No one's going to do anything about it, right? They're trying to set up this, the research here. So methodological, methodological approaches could also leverage state variation in the types of guns restricted and the minimum age laws for outcome data and have information on the type of firearm involved. All right. So state of implementation of minimum age requirements. As of January 1st, 2021, 17 states in the District of Columbia have minimum age requirements that exceed the federal minimum age for the purchase of a handgun from unlicensed persons, and eight states in the District of Columbia have minimum age requirements that exceed the federal minimum for handgun possession. Several states also have minimums that are higher than the federal law for long gun purchase and possession. Eight states in the District of Columbia restrict all handgun sales to individuals aged 21 or older and long gun sales to individuals 18 or older. In effect, this raises the minimum age restrictions above those set by federal law in two ways. The age to purchase handguns through private sales is raised from 18 to 21, and minimum age for private sales to 18. Okay, so this doesn't... This is saying the effects. Um, so there's no study that says, the, you know, we found no qualifying studies showing that minimum age requirements increased any of the eight outcomes we investigated, which is mass shootings, unintentional injuries, and death, for, and may decrease suicide. No study has been our criteria for defensive gun use, gun industry outcomes, hunting and recreation, or police shootings. So these, we no clue, increase or decrease. There's some inconclusive evidence here. So if I click on mass shootings. Oh, so here's interesting. So they did see some information here. So the author's analysis covered 1989 to 2014. It's a pretty good range. Include controls for state fixed effects, national trends, and a host of other state level gun policies, as well as time varying state level demographic, socioeconomic, and political characteristics. They found uncertain effects of law saying 18 is the minimum age of purchase and the probability of a mass shooting event occurring, but they found a suggestive effect consistent with laws setting 21 as the minimum age of purchase, reducing the likelihood of a mass shooting occurrence in models that include controls for political factors. However, it should be noted that assessing the effects of gun policies on mass shootings was not the primary focus of Luca, Alhorta, and Pollock in 2016. So they weren't looking for this, and they did find some effect uh, for estimates. But again, it's inconclusive, right? We don't have these gun policies in effect, so we can't for sure say. We can't go back in time, right? We can't go back in time and rerun the same scenario. I'm just going through these, but this is interesting. Gun ownership and homicide selected countries. This is, of course, we don't know if this is the cause, right? Um, but it's 
interesting to sort of show like most of these places do you kind of go down based upon the information the only place that breaks that trend is israel so if you just saw this data we don't see all the data right? but if we just saw this data one of the questions might be what's different about israel that causes it not to go down you know as gun ownership per capita goes down it's a question now this isn't linear it's not a linear change so there's other things clearly a factor um, but you do have huge huge much smaller much smaller a little bit smaller a little bit smaller a little bit smaller a little bit smaller like it just keeps right it keeps going down but there's clearly other things going on because like 34.7 versus 30 0.5 versus 0.18. There's something else in between here from Canada to Australia. <laughs> it might just be its proximity to the United States or how it's getting weapons from the United States. I wonder if that's true with Israel too. But I know that, you know, guns from the U.S. can get into Canada for sure. I wonder if they have other information here. Oh, Canada's got a 28-day waiting period. Mandatory safety training courses, more detailed background checks, ban on large capacity rifles, ban on bans or greater restrictions of military style firearms and ammunitions. All right, so they, they don't go over any of those additional kind of differences, but that that's interesting. It doesn't apply to the question. Okay, so one means after the law is passed, we'd affect nothing to be affected. Example of the effect size were 0 0.92, we'd expect the rate of the outcome to fall to 0.92 times the rate prior to passage of the law. So at the minimum purchase age of 18, you know, it's basically a one, there's no change, um, but there is a big range, right? So keep that in mind. Um, and then the state minimum purchase age of 21 drops it. So on the highest level, there's a lot more noise here, it looks like, right? A wider range. Um, but the with from their rating of the analysis, their prediction would be that basically like gun violence it's all in half so again not perfect but fall in half that's pretty effective right that's what they're trying to say for mass shootings that's mass shootings would fall in half. unintentional injuries and deaths so you couldn't really see on this one they have a lot they have lower the comparisons they did specifically seek like looking for this information they also only found one right study again we need more studies so inconclusive evidence, um, but from the evidence seen, the, per, the hypothesis might be that it would lower, it may decrease, but we don't know, right? Here we have five studies for violent crime. That's better all because it was so conclusive that those who were not really doing anything before nor were caught by this might be seeing the effects of that broader suite of policy changes or limited information studies so something definitely to be studying because they're seeing sometimes effect sometimes not so much effect but it does lend to maybe where that 21 year age kind of statements coming from right which was the question we kind of set out to answer there's a couple of things right one is violence peaks at 20 for most of these groups, possession, ownership, purchase, um, all kind of connected together, low seem to lower estimates say suggest uh, there would be less crime committed by those folks if they weren't allowed to get a firearm till they were twenty one uh, from actual events taking place. But the data is small um, and thus inconclusive. And in some instances. Um, this shows no effect at all. Okay, got it. Um, let's see what this other thing says. So, this is the bearingarms.com. I'm 100% certain that they will conclude that there's no impact, not just from the tile, but you can tell from the, the website, right? They wouldn't, they wouldn't publish something on here that would say, hey, it's got an effect, so don't let your kid have a gun, right? See? Bearing arms. Let's see. So they've linked to a study called studyfinds.org. 
I'm not sure uh, what kind of site that is, but it's really kind of kind of on the nose, right? Anyway, so uh, do laws barring those under the age of 21 from legally purchasing handguns, and in some states, certain semi-automatic long guns actually make a difference in terms of reducing violent crime and homicides. So this study, surprisingly, doesn't show much effect. This isn't a study, though. This is an article. Here we go. The study is published. JAMA Pediatrics. Let's follow this trail. Here we go. Hey, Mo. I wonder if this is the same Mo. Could be the same article. Uh, our state laws are raised minimum age purchase handguns by young adults. And this difference in different sales, the national cohort. There's no statistically significant change in the rates of homicides perpetrated by young adults aged 18 to 20 in states that implemented stricter minimum age laws compared with those that did not. Wait, wait, wait. Are they specifically talking about firearms? This is a, this is a little confusingly written. Like, if we're looking at this specifically, rates of homicides versus firearm homicides. Okay, so implementation of stricter minimum age laws for firearm purchase or possession was not associated with lower rates of firearm homicides perpetrated perpetrated by young adults, policies limiting access to informal channels may have greater effect. We saw a little bit of that, right, in the other article. Um, I'm interested, though, what they suggest for these informal channels, because bearing arms is basically linking to this through it, the network of stuff, right? So in the other article, is talking about how difficult it was to get the age of the perpetrator so I'm wondering how they got them, but maybe they just looked at studies that showed the age of the perpetrator. Hmm. Okay, so this one does show that child access prevention laws have demonstrated associations with reductions in suicides and unintentional shootings by children and youth. Cool. <laughs> this, is, this is the understatement of the year. Legislating firearms, however, is a logistically complex and politically contentious undertaking. Yeah, for sure. The effects of many state firearm laws sensibly intended to prevent lethal violence use. Firearms have not been studied. Yeah, we talked about a little bit of the complication there. Uh, so here's one of the things where I think it's always really weird. Although the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968 established a minimum age of 21 years to purchase handguns from licensed dealers, the law did not extend to unlicensed dealers. Again, that seems so bizarre to me. I, the unlicensed dealer gets to do more stuff legally with fewer with less oversight than the licensed dealer does. It just seems bizarre. Why are they even selling? Or how did they, you know, why are they even allowed to sell anything to begin with? Anyways, this changed in 1994 when the federal government established an age. Now they are sort of limiting it. So their objective was to evaluate whether state laws that raised minimum age to purchase or possess handgun to 21 years were associated with lower rates of firearm homicide per perpetrated by young adults aged 18 to 20 years. There might be something that's slipping through the cracks with this limitation, right? By not, all, you know, by banning access to the guns up until 21, you might also be decreasing the likelihood of purchasing, getting one, or going and seeking it as an option, right? For those people who are 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, yeah, right? Because that peak violence at 21. So I'm wondering if they limited themselves artificially this way, like were firearm homicides just reduced overall because access became less likely? Because at the end of the day, if the goal is to just reduce firearm-associated homicides, but not as concerned about which age group of people are essentially victims, right? We're just trying to lower the number of victims overall. We don't really care who's perpetrating them, rather, I should say. So it doesn't matter if it's a, you know, 30-year-old man or woman versus an 18-year-old man or woman. It's just lowering the number of men and women committing crimes, gun violence that cause, you know, gun murders, right? Y you know what I'm saying, right? It could have an effect outside of that realm, but they're limiting the scope. But we'll see what this says. So, so here's states without stricter minimum age laws. States with stricter minimum age laws. And you can see some of these, like Maryland, just boom, over the time. Right? It's like it's tricky because Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Wyoming 
who knows what's going on otherwise with those right you have some of it but maryland has this crazy drop it's tough to see if any of those happen here but i see them you, you get a lot more noise here these generally are resolving quite a bit lower right this is starting way higher you see this peak this dramatic peak i guess i don't know what year that was just kind of identify what was going on but down up down and that's so interesting but you can see the other four states other than maryland are way below that median income median uh, line huh and you've got quite a few down here but they were looks like maybe we're always down there so that might be adjusting for this i don't know it's tough to see based upon these figures alone, like which one's which. Yeah, like that 0.21 in Massachusetts, 1.74 in Maryland. Maryland was suffering some kind of problem. Sure. Yeah. So since they're not acquired legally, they didn't see much change. But there is interesting, some interesting data for some places um, that could be studied likely more. Like what else is going on, right? Oh, interesting. So only until they can find the person and kind of link it. Um, it is saying that crime is made by non-contact weapons. Handgun were less likely to be cleared than homicides, including contact weapons such as a knife, right? So even if maybe there's not a change in homicides, could shift some in that direction. And they talk about confounding possession versus just purchase. Okay, I think I think we're good there. Okay, so what else does this say? Kayla Mo. Oh, that's the same person. Yeah. Okay, so we're seeing that that kind of informal access is what we can identify, but there's a lot of confounding other issues. Now they're saying coerce to use reduction is a way of helping to reduce crime because it's related to criminals. I don't know what this is. One of the confounding things this article goes over is um, the amount of stolen gun stockpile is estimated to be somewhere near 200 million guns, which confounds a lot of this process. Now, this is in 1996. So, I mean, I know that the way that some other countries have handled that is they do an optional buyback program, right? Like people just can sell their weapons for a pretty good market rate to the government just purchasing them and then they get destroyed, right? Um, that happened in Australia. That happened in a couple other places. Um, and that usually has, you'd be surprised, right? Like if I'm a poor person on the street who uses my gun to you know, steal five bucks here and 10 bucks there from people holding them up, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sell that gun if I'm going to get hundreds of dollars for it, right? Gangs will do it to get money or whatever. As long as you're not asking people information, you just, Hey, come in, give me the, give me the gun. Right? And then we'll do it. The Boston gun project. We're going to have to look that up more, but it's the only thing this goes over. So I would argue that, and it's kind of old. Yeah, in a 1996 paper. So that's pretty tough. So they're seeing the widespread adoption of the strategy of Boston already reduced ju juvenile, juvenile homicide rate by more than 50%. Operation Ceasefire seems like something that hasn't continued. But anyhow, it seems pretty clear that right now the answer to the question, what is what is the 21 year age limit based upon? Would be that violence from perpetrators peaks at age 20. And so if we can help prevent guns getting into those people's hands below the age of 20, there's that, there's a peripheral effect of reducing the supply of guns available to people to get informally, um, but by and large, Right, so the, the the largest chunk of those violence, I think it was like the eighty three percent of suicides could would still continue 
and like um, much more and a still high percentage of of homicides, right? Because they don't they don't go buy their their weapons. But um, we there's a potential that you know maybe ten percent of gun murders, gun homicides could be prevented in that small age group of 18 to 20 through this law. However, we have no idea about what else it could reduce or restrict. Um, if possession is also in that list, that makes it easier to police. Lots and lots of things could be peripheral to that. But to be fair, um, we don't have a great answer to that specific idea of 21. Why 21? Okay. What about background checks? So, well, the first one is, can they reduce gun, uh, universal background checks? Can they reduce stuff, um, effects on back of background checks? I think we, maybe we read this, right? I think this one we've seen pop up a few times, right? It even talked about it in the file from the JAMA article from, uh, the Bearing Arms place where background checks did more than other things. Um, so dealer background checks have uncertain effects on violent crimes and total homicides. May decrease. Evidence for this relationship is moderate. So there's there's some limit, some good data here. And this one's showing background checks were found to significantly reduce firearms homicides by 20%. So seeing permits versus licensing this is background checks. So generally agreeing that background checks with proper permitting to purchase kind of processes set in place, purchase, no, permit to purchase. Generally what these are showing is that background checks are mandatory at all points of sale from private, individual, and dealers has a net positive effect on, well, negative effect on the actual homicide rate, right? Lowering the amount of homicides, but positive on the city, county, or state uh, level reductions. Now, they don't have the ability to, you know, test that same state again, like without doing other stuff, but through these data analyses, um, they're able to see, you know, oftentimes 10, 13% reduction in gun homicides and that's that's pretty good um background checks on their own right we're not even talking about um waiting time frames so we're seeing like in most instances we've got some good things so ten size meter inclusion criteria examine the effect yeah so mental illness restraining order checks or fugitive status checks reduce violent crimes specific to homicides and then others miscellaneous but misdemeanor offenses didn't seem to have a, as clear. So they're talking about just in general. So overall dealer background checks may be uncertain, but some components do show a connection. So they're still leaving it as uncertain, even though they have some evidence up above as listed. Here we go. Universal background checks. This was the one with moderate. So in cities, a significant 12% reduction in homicide in the U.S. cities after these laws were implemented, but they don't see us they see an uncertain effect in rural areas, which might make sense because if you're 14 miles away from somebody, you're probably less likely to also want to murder them. Um, said rates drop 11 to 15%, well, 11 and 15% respectively, according to the studies, 3% reduction in workplace homicides. Saw that universal background checks implemented as part of a permit to purchase laws were associated with significantly reduced firearm homicides. So overall, it's looking like generally speaking, background checks at the dealer, private sales has a general decrease, seems more open, more clear, right? Moderate evidence. It's not clear, right? Obviously, um, we still need to do testing and things like that. But um, what exactly we're looking for in those background checks may or may not have more moderate effects. So mental illness, fugitive status, and misdemeanors, right? Restraining orders, there you go. So included background checks, restraining orders, mental illness, fugitive status, and misdemeanors, depending upon what it was, could have an association. So we're going to mark that one 
as pretty good. So the the answer to the question, right? So we're we're down to number two. So what is the twenty one year age limit based upon? We answer that question. For the criteria with the background check, that would disqualify someone from making a purchase. Um, we can see with the, we already looked at the background checks, which ones have the most effect. So we can see that association and we could keep tweaking that and optimizing as time goes on, right? Um, as we needed to. Um, but that seems like there's definitely something there uh, because we saw lots of moderate evidence for them. So what would be a reasonable waiting period? Um, okay. We'll do these two. We'll kind of go from there. So, um, from science.org, gun waiting periods could have hundreds, could save hundreds of lives a year, study says. Keep in mind, Canada's got like a, what was that, like 28 day, 38 day waiting period? It was, it was pretty long. They found the states with mandatory waits, no matter the total length, had on average 17% fewer murders and about 10% fewer suicides. So that's pretty good. Oh, here's an interesting. So, in 1994, the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act mandated background checks for all handgun purchases from licensed firearm dealers nationwide, as well as a five-day waiting period to carry out these checks. It meant that 19 states without waiting periods suddenly had them. Found a sharp 70% drop-off in gun homicides, 6% reduction in suicides. And the states has waiting period laws. Okay. Still always some questions on whether or not it's a causal relationship, of course. Okay. So that's an article. There's some reports here. I want to see what this this has. So, uh, the brand, Brady Handgun in effect, five day waiting period may decrease suicide and violent crime, and, but not defensive gun use, hunting and recreation, and police shootings or unintentional injuries and deaths. So, they didn't see anything related to those that met their criteria. There's a secondary effect of waiting periods may provide law enforcement with opportunities to investigate possible straw purchases. Which is good, right? Reduce crimes of passion. Additional time to complete background checks. In 2021, for instance, 5,203 firearms were confirmed to be transferred from federally licensed firearm dealers to prohibited persons. Some inconvenience may discourage some gun sales. Might take fewer trips to the dealer. So it might affect industries. Not the thing I'd be worried about, right? Like fact that like the actual gun stores make less money i don't think that's part of the concern here when we're weighing a constitutional amendment got the first three answers we've gone over the 21 year age limit the criteria for the background check what would be the reasonable waiting period literally any any waiting period and we went over the statistics on crimes uh, on just not even crimes of passion just gun violence and gun murder. I don't really care if it's covered passion or not. So that's one of those specifically targeted questions that we don't really need to answer. And what are the criteria used to define a particular firearm as an assault weapon? So this is the last question. Here we go. So since Gavin Newsom is from California, let's take a look. What is the definition of an assault weapon in California? This probably will give us an indication of what an assault weapon would be in those in those laws california's definition of assault weapons include specific models such as the ak and colt ar-15 series in addition to guns with assaultive as opposed to defensive features including semi-automatic center fire rifles the capacity for a detachable magazine and either a pistol grip that protrudes conspicuously beneath the action of the gun a thumb hole stock or folding or telescoping stock grenade or flare launcher a flash suppressor or a forward pistol grip. Firearms that fall under the definition of assault weapons are generally illegal within the state. Mm-hmm. California defines an assault weapon in three different ways, by make and model, by series, and by certain generic characteristics, which we could do in this case. Uh, each method of defining an assault weapon as a category of firearm is an assault weapon. If it is identified such by any of these categories, the breadth of these definitions make state law in California one of the strictest gun control. The definitions reach past machine guns and cover many semi-automatic firearms that are popular with gun owners as well. So here's category one assault weapons. It looks like there's a lot. Category two, I don't know what the different categories mean. I'm not in California. 
There's some guns that are exempted, antique firearms, pistol used in Olympic target shooting, certain various weapons here. And number 30th, this being a large capacity magazine was reinstated. So part of it came back, even though it got overturned. All right. So the question then becomes maybe, so what does NPR say? My guess is it's gonna, they're going to say it lowers it. Joe Biden helped with that. In fact, we saw a 25% reduction in gun violence associated with those kinds of slaughters. Okay. They say there's no study. So just assault weapon bans or buybacks will have little, if any, effect on gun rates. So I'm, so interesting. Yeah, they're using Wikipedia. But oh, where are they getting this? Okay, oh, Mother Jones, they're comparing strain. Oh my goodness. So this comparison is just not accurate. So they're looking at total homicides, gun homicides, 103,000 to heroin, total mass shooting homicides, and the mass shooting homicides above and assault rifles. So half of the mass shootings were done with assault weapons. We don't know how many of these 103,901 were done by assault weapons, unless that FBI data, their link doesn't work and it's probably just old. So then that's, that's not an accurate comparison. We can disregard this, the effects of this chart and the conversation about the, yeah, see this, They're saying that assault weapons constitute 0.17 and 0.24% of all homicides of firearm homicides respectively. Right. Are they just taking 253 and dividing it into 103,000? Is that what they're doing? Yes, that is exactly what they're doing. Um, which means that they're completely off base with this assessment. Um, because we don't, again, we're not talking, we don't know how many are in here? Over the last five years, 261 people were murdered with assault weapons and mass shootings, an average of 52 murders annually. Yeah, it would take 30 years of mass shootings, but what about regular shootings? They're, they're, oh my goodness. So it's, So here's the, the JAMA article. Let's see what. It's firearm laws. So this is from that site. That site linking to firearm laws and firearm house as systematic review. We. So stronger gun policies were associated with decreased rates of firearm homicide, even after adjusted for demographic and sociological factors. Strengthening background checks, permit to purchase, specific laws directed at firearm trafficking, improving child safety, or banning of military style assault weapons. Oh, we're not trying to state. Where's the full article? So this is interesting. They're pointing to an article that says laws strengthen background checks and permit to purchase seem to decrease firearm homicides, but specific laws directed to firearm trafficking, improving child safety, or banning military style assault weapons were not associated with changes in firearm homicide rates. Ah, well, I can't get to that. Someone has this fall. That would be good. But it does seem to go against what we've seen otherwise. Right? Well, I can go against, but also counters, right? Okay, so yeah, gun crimes involving assault weapons declined. However, that decline was offset through at least the late 90s by steady or rising use of other guns gripped large capacity magazines. So, assault weapons, which in California includes large capacity magazines, does have a good effect, though effectiveness is difficult.
This is interesting. How much back and forth there is. So background checks, that screen for mental health is something that even this place agrees with. The average firearm homicide rates in states without background checks is 58% higher than the average in states with background check laws in place. Only 13 states, including Massachusetts, laws requiring universal background checks. So I'll link this one too. Right now I'm getting to the end, so I'm trying to get through somewhat quickly. So we're going to see what Rand has to say. So far they've done a, it seems like a pretty good no. I don't know. Um, it's tough. They at least are fair with some of the stuff they're talking about. Some things were cosmetic. That seems likely. So small weapons with high capacity magazines are usually together. So that confounds the issue. They repeat the majority of crimes are not connected with rifles, but with handguns. Most of which are not considered assault weapons, although most assault weapon bans also list certain assault pistols among the banned firearms. Okay. This is where I was talking about, like, the rifle versus pistol thing with the person in the park. It's very, it's very bizarre to me as a non-gun person. I would just say, look at the crimes that are being committed and which weapons are there and see if there's a commonality that makes them lethal, right? more lethal than that. And if you're going to put restrictions or extra background checks on things, put them on those weapons, maybe. It, it doesn't feel like it's an unsolvable problem to limit the regulation to the most likely used weapons. Okay, so it's kind of inconclusive if you just do assault weapons, but no one just does assault weapons. Do assault weapons with high capacity magazines and oftentimes bundled with particular kinds of pistols. And that seems to generally have an effect. You know, this is the study that just did one a little bit of time afterwards. They're very focused on mass shootings, which I get, like, mass shootings are very... They're such big events that they make news, right? All right, so let's go back to this Twitter post. 21-year age limit seems to have some basis in reality and more study necessary um, plus secondary effects. Uh, we need to study those long-term secondary effects or peripheral effects on it, like lowering the supply or having an effect on a person who's older than 21, uh, or 20 rather, right? So the 21-year and higher where they could get them. But it does seem to have an effect, at the very least, with handguns, potentially inside cities, things like that. So there's there's some there's some evidence that seems more compelling than not for that age limit, but it's also inconclusive. I'd say this is probably the least conclusive one because we have very bad data um, and not a lot of data about like all of the the murders and what the age of the criminal is, right? Criteria for the background check that seems really as a pretty clear answer. We have some specific background checks already in place. I don't know all the things that go into them, but we looked at a couple of things that seem to genuinely lead uh, to reductions in homicides. Uh, waiting periods, it seems like any waiting period seemed to tr help. Just any waiting period in any state across the United States. Um, there wasn't compelling arguments for like a really long waiting period like maybe Canada has or other you know, countries have, um, but any waiting period at all. So we could start there, right? Um, exactly what we order the criteria used to find particular firearm as an assault weapon. There is very clear criteria about that across a bunch of different states, but in particular for Gathmanism, it's probably the, the classifications that were in the California assault weapon ban. Um, and the effect of that is inconclusive on whether or not the assault weapon is the cause or other parts and particular features. But we can certainly, if we sort of open the door to a lot more data and analysis and long-term studies, see, we could start maybe conservatively, right? Like, so we'd look at large high-capacity magazines and we'd look at particular, you know, nuanced features and, and put those in there. Just start there, right? Just start something see if there's an effect if there is an effect we can start adding certain other features and if we found 
that certain features did not reduce homicides, right? We could take them out of the ban. Like that doesn't seem like it's difficult to do in terms of an analysis or analytic sort of way. It seems like it's difficult to do because of political will. But as we talked about, if you're for any kind, so you're for any kind of regulation, you cannot stand behind the idea that the Second Amendment allows zero infringement. If you're for the zero infringement mentality, you've got to be logically also for allowing violent criminals, rapists, molesters, anybody who's gone to, you know, the you know, prison and come back or committed any of these crimes before to having access to these weapons. Um, because that right requires no infringement possible. And you're literally infringing on their right to have access to that if you're having these. But we know background checks work in particular ways. Uh, we know that uh, some of these other effects have definite, you know, reductions that seem good. And again, maybe we start more conservatively on this. We we do the ones that we have the best evidence for right now. Uh, we start with those, opening it up to review, forced review, like, right, create a forced review every year on the data that comes out across the board and continue to adjust and assess this information in order to maximize the amount of freedom and minimize the amount of harm that's possible while reducing the supply. Unfortunately, you're not going to get that buy-in from gun manufacturers, right? Uh, by reducing supply, you're reducing their sales in their biggest uh, hotspot of purchasers. Uh, that said, I don't care about the manufacturers of guns. I care about the people which is what the Constitution is there to protect. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.